Welcome and thank you for joining us. My name is Maya and I am an educator here at ScienceWorks. We are excited to have Johnny here with us today, an expert in animal forensics. So thank you for spending some time with us today. Please give us a short description of what you do and then we can talk about it in more detail. For example, your job title and maybe the degrees that you got and your science background. Sure. So I am Johnny French. I am the collections manager with the National Fish and Wildlife uh, Forensics Lab. So that's my main job is the collections manager. So I manage the known reference collection. It's basically a very large natural history museum. Um, that we use to compare unknown evidence items to in order to make an identification when an item comes in and we're not sure what it is. We have something to compare it to. Um, my educational background, I have an associate's degree in science, I have a bachelor's degree in zoology, and I have a master's degree in biology. Oh. So, I think I I've see been in school the, a long time. <laughs> I see the collection right behind you. That's exciting. So you're down there right now? I am. I'm sitting in our in our collection. Um, this is so this is a brand new facility. Uh, so we've been basically all we, all I've been doing for about the last six months is moving the whole collection in. Um, so we have a collection of mammals birds and reptiles and all together there's probably a hundred thousand specimens that are in in the collection um, and it's everything from bones and skulls to hides um, study skins and then we also have artifacts we have wildlife trafficking products um, and things like that so anything from illegal snakeskin boots to um, to fur seal um, coats, to purses made out of primates. We have this absolutely macabre collection of stuff that that people um, people like to trade. Um, they'll go on vacation and not without thinking they'll buy um, a leopard skin hat not realizing these things are very, very endangered. Sometimes they don't even realize it's an actual leopard skin. Sometimes they think it's fake. So we have quite the collection of, of stuff that we see in the wildlife trade. Solving animal crimes is your main job or? That is what the lab does. Um, so we are the CITES lab. Um, CITES is the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. So we work with 182 countries worldwide um, to analyze, process, analyze evidence, process the evidence, and work with special agents and prosecutors to, to help st stop this illegal wildlife trade. And it could be anything from illegal timber to um, most everyone has heard of pangolins. Um, then it could be something like uh, hats with feathers, these big ballroom hats or um, um, masks, masquerade ball masks. Um, we see tons and tons of stuff. Um, hummingbird love charms is one of the constant things we see coming through the lab. So when you get an object, what is the first question you usually start with? The first question we usually start with is, what is this? What species is this? Do we even need to know what species it is? Or is something more generic like, is genus okay? Or is family okay? Depending on the protections afforded under CITES or the ESA, and depending on what the special agent would like to know. Um, it really depends on what question the special agent has for us is the question we answer. But typically step one is, what is this? And then what is the next question? 
Uh, well, it again, it all depends on the special agent. Um, a lot of times it's what is this? Um, if they're looking to determine cause of death, like in a poaching kill, if someone poaches a, a wolf or if someone poaches a deer in a national park or something like that, they're going to ask, how did this die? Um, it may be if it's a necklace of bear claws or something. One of the questions might be, okay, how many bears are represented in this necklace? Is this one bear or is this multiple bears? My next question is, scientists often need to solve problems. What kind of obstacles come up in your work and how do you manage them? Well, the, one of the biggest obstacles we see is we can get an animal, we can get a wildlife product in from anywhere, especially if something is seized at a port of entry and you have no idea where that particular item came from. So take big cats here in the United States, for example. There's really only two species of big cat in North America. You have um, cougars and you have jaguars. So I actually have some show and tell for you. So what you'll see is, like I said, the very f one of the first questions they ask is, what is this? Now, when you only have two big cats in North America to worry about, these two are pretty obviously different. This one is so much bigger and more robust than this little guy. So jaguars are much, much bigger than cougars. So these two are pretty easy to tell apart. But if you throw in, you have no idea what continent it came from, and you have no idea what location it came from, then you run into an issue like this. So. We know this guy is very, very small, but we have no idea where this came from. And these two look very, very, very similar, wouldn't you say? Oh, yeah. So this is the kinds of issues that we run into, um, is how do you distinguish one species from another? So this, of course, is a jaguar, because we already said that, and this is a leopard. So what we have to do is figure out how to distinguish a leopard from a jaguar. And if you look, let's see if one of the ways is the shape of the skull. So do you see how this guy is kind of convex and this guy is more concave? Oh. And then if you look at the teeth, let's see if we can get a good shot of the teeth here. So if you look at the teeth from a jaguar, see how much See how round they are, kind of big yeah. and sturdy? And then the leopard has these kind of finer, more oval, dagger-like teeth. So that's kind of a simplified version of, of what we do here. Um, the biggest issues we run into. That's why it's so important to have this huge collection that's back here behind me. Because if we don't know what something is, we have to have a comparison. We have to be able to compare it to something to say, okay, well, this has a com this has a concave forehead, so we know it's not this. So let's start looking at the teeth. Um, there's even grooves on the teeth that we look at, things like that. Does that make sense? That was kind of a long winded answer, it but it does. It, and this is called morphology, is that correct? That that is correct. So morphology is the study of shape. And I basically just gave you a rundown of how it works. <laughs> so you look at the different shapes of animals. You look at the sizes. Typically, a jaguar is going to be. Let's go back down here. A jaguar is going to be much, much bigger, and more robust. And a leopard's going to be smaller. Different shaped foreheads. Different shaped teeth. So that's kind of how. That's kind of how we say. We start adding up all of these different things, the size, the shape of the teeth, are there grooves in the teeth, the shape of the skull, and you start adding these little layers on, and that's how you may end up making a species determination based on morphology. 
It looks like that one skull has a little hole in the top of it. Is that supposed to be there? Let's see. That is definitely not supposed to be there. That is actually a gunshot wound. And you can actually see where it came out the other side. Can you see that? Oh, yeah, I can. So it, got, it went all the way through the brain case and out the bottom. So, and this actually killed this animal. Um, I'm glad you brought that up because your next question is going to be, well, how do you know it killed the animal? So we have this guy. So do you see how jagged that hole is? Yeah. So here is, we're going to set this guy off to the side right now. Here is a cougar skull. And this is actually from Lake County, Oregon. Um, ODFW donated this to us. This, this cat was found on a hiking trail. Someone picked it up, carried it back to the ODFW office, and turned it in. So they donated it to us, and I thought it was very, very interesting because you can see. So let's get a normal skull versus this skull. Mm -hmm. And you can see all of that damage right on top of the skull. Do you see that? Yeah. And it this is actually. Grew like that. Yep, so what happened with this cat? was it was shot just above the eyeball this way and a bullet came through the skull and took off the top of the mandible let's see if we can so you see the broken mandible this is what a mandible is supposed to look like nice and round plenty of points for muscle attachment well this side it's been shattered and broken off now remember how jagged this hole was mm -hmm. if you look you can see how smooth this is now let's look at let's move this guy you see how this suture comes straight back along can you yeah. see that i i the, can see it so this bit. suture comes straight back along the skull this is the sagittal crest the sagittal suture well on this cat it has started moving off this way and all of these edges are nice and rounded off so this cat actually survived being shot and lived for a long time because the bones started healing. There's actually, so right about here, inside the skull, there's still bullet fragments that got embedded and the bone grew around it. Mm -hmm. um, and then, can you see, let's get up close, can you see the, how big this tooth is versus how small this tooth is? Actually, I can. It looks nice and small and smooth on the other side. Yep, so this side, yep, this side is the side with the whole mandible. So this cat favored, he didn't chew on his right side, this side over here, for a very, very long time. And all the teeth on the left side of his, his, uh, his jaw got worn down because he favored that side so much after being shot. So that's kind of, you know, if this had came to us as um, evidence or as a case, we would have been asked first, what is this? And I'll just walked you through how we did um, the species identification using morphology. The second question would have been, how did this cat die? Now. Chances are the answer would be old age or complications from this gunshot wound. But we know from these smooth edges and the, how the bullet fragments inside the skull have, have been enclosed in bone um, that this cat survived this. So the cause of death could be undetermined. Now if we wanted to figure out if this was a male cat or a female cat, then we could take a little bit of sample of bone, send it over to our geneticists, and they could tell us that as well. We so that's figure kind of, it all out from the bones. That's, that's kind of what we do here. And if, 
if it was so close, you know, if we couldn't determine it by morphology, what exactly it was, we can always take samples. You know, we can definitely say this is Panthera. You know, we're not sure if it's Panthera onca or Panthera partis. We're not sure if it's a jaguar or a leopard. We can always send it over to genetics, and genetics can do that species determination for us. It just takes them a little bit longer, and it's a little bit more money because they have all this really neat high-tech equipment. They have robots, and they have to use a bunch of chemicals and stuff. So, so if we can determine something using morphology without having to um, do more, uh, put more work on our geneticists, we like to do that. It looks like there's still some fun stuff behind you. Is there anything else you wanted to show the audience? Uh, well, back here, let's let's see if we can get a better picture of this. This is just cougar hides, um, is all this is. Let's see if I figured I would bring these out, and show you. So you can see how big a cougar paw is. Yeah. Some people may not have ever. I was about to say, look at his little paw, and then you put it in your hand. It's actually so big. It's, it's not very, I mean, I don't have gigantic ones, but you know, they're very, very long. They can have very big paws. So here is actually a jaguar paw. Oh. Actually, leopard paw. You can see how big the thing is see his claws so cats are an apex predator they're uh cats scare me when i'm out hiking in the woods <laughs> i think they scare all of us so do I mean, you have even... any good advice if you do see a big cat in the wild or on a hike i am not an expert in that i've always <laughs> been run away because it will if you see one slowly back away, if you try to run, it triggers a predatory response. So it's better to just slowly back away. Um, I have run across bears in the wild, and that tends to work for bears, because I used to live in Alaska. Um, well, definitely in Ashland, there's been bears that walk up into my friends' backyards. <laughs> and they lock all the doors, and they pretend like it's not there. <laughs> That's probably the best course of action. <laughs> Um, so another question I have is, what is the most enjoyable part of your work, or the weirdest, least enjoyable part of your work, whatever stands out the most to you? I always tell everyone, I get paid to check emails and go to meetings. <laughs> everything, everything else in here I would do for free. I have the greatest job in the world. Um, and it's always something new. One day, I, one day I'm talking to you guys about big cats. The next day I'm working with my flesh-eating beetles. The day after that I am helping arrange birds. The day after that I might be doing, uh, creating bases or mounts for taxidermy that we get in. I have the greatest job in the world, and I'm so lucky to be here. No. I spent a what advice lot of would you give to students who'd want to work in animal forensics? Oh, volunteer. If you want to, if, if you want to work in any type of biologist position, any type of wildlife position, start volunteering as soon as you can, because that volunteer experience is crucial. Because even once you've got a bachelor's degree or a master's degree, most places are going to look for three, four, five years of experience. And most people aren't able to work full time at, while they're getting a bachelor's degree and a master's degree. You know, some people do, some people might not be able to. And even if you do work full time, you're probably not working with wildlife as you're trying to put yourself through school. So. The best advice I can give is volunteer. Start volunteering as soon as you you are legally able to. So here at the lab, you have to be 16 to volunteer. Um, it's it's a little bit different. So Forest Service has a little bit different rules. Uh, it, it just depends on which agency you're trying to volunteer with. But any type of volunteer experience is 
one, so much fun. I learned so much just volunteering all around. I volunteered for state parks. I volunteered for ODFW. I volunteered for uh, the Washington State Fishing Game, the USGS, throughout my my college career, and it was very rewarding. You got to meet tons and tons and tons of interesting people, and in the end, you're you're able to put all of that experience on a resume when you go to apply for jobs because you've been volunteering, you've been working with animals for so long. Mm -hmm. And this is a special facility because it's the only one in the United States. The one you so, have. This is the only. What's the best way? This is the only full service, full service wildlife crime lab. So we do morphology, we do chemistry, we do genetics, we do criminalistics, so we can do ballistics, um, we do pathology, so we're completely full service. There are other wildlife crime labs out there. Um, the Rotus Lab in South Africa is an excellent wildlife crime lab, but they typically specialize in genetics. Um, there are some, some other labs around um, the Wyoming Fish and Game has a wildlife crime lab, but it's typically genetics is also. Um, California has a really good um, wildlife crime lab. But the thing that sets us apart is, one, the collection that's back here behind me. And two, just the massive amount of different skill sets we have here. Some of the smartest people I've ever met work at this lab. And they're completely dedicated to, to what they do um, in their own little special way. Like half this lab thinks I'm so weird because I, I sit in a museum and I, you know, I look at skulls or I have a flesh-eating beetle colony. But at the same time, I think some of these people are weird. You know, I, I, I have a desire to sit and pipette things into tubes all day. Like to me, that sounds horrible, but they love it. So you put all you put all these different you put all these really smart people together in one place, and and really good things happen. It's uh it's always fun to work here. Well, I don't want to say too much, but there is some unsolved crimes in that facility, right? That the public can't quite see yet. There is, um, there is, and we can't talk about it until the case is adjudicated. So like this this gunshot wound jaguar this was once a case you know maybe 15 years ago so that's kind of that's one of the ways we get our specimens is we'll see something in the wildlife trade it gets seized in customs we work it here as evidence and then once the case is adjudicated and you know once the case is solved and it goes through the court system then we'll ask for that evidence back. To, that way we can kind of keep track of what's going on in the wildlife trade. Um, and then the other way is um, donations from zoos or other museums. We actually don't, we don't collect anything here. Everything is donated to us. So it's, it's really helpful to have a good working relationship with zoos. <laughs> we get stuff from zoos all over the country. Those guys are great. Well, thank you again for sharing your experience with us today. It was really fascinating to hear how you use science to solve these mysteries. And again, you're a morphologist. It was a cool new term that I didn't know existed before. So any young scientists out there looking for a career in animal forensics, maybe take a look into that field. And anybody, work, anybody that lives in Ashland, it does sound like there's fun volunteer opportunities, uh, albeit it'll take a little while, but I had a lot of fun touring the facility, so I encourage anybody to volunteer if they can. So, do you have take any a last look, words? Yeah, take a look at our website. It's fws.gov slash lab, um, and then it gives you a, a broader rundown of what we do here. Plus, the feather atlas is on there, so if you happen to find a feather in the street, you can pull up the feather atlas on your phone, and so this is a brown feather with black stripes. You type that in, and the feather atlas will pop it up and give you an ID for what that feather is. So. 
There's a whole library of information then. <laughs> well, that's exciting. Yep. Well, I, I really appreciate your time. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, and thanks for talking with us. We'll see you again, maybe. Hopefully. <laughs> Bye-bye. And again, I'm Maya with some news.